I'd like us to open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Now, Christ has turned 12, and up to this moment, we haven't heard him say anything. And actually, he's going to say something I, I, I would consider very, 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 very profound. And then we're not going to hear from him again for a, another 18 years. But the bar mitzvah was happening, so Christ comes down at 12 years old, and he was so responsible, he was so dependable, he was so reliable, that Joseph and Mary were not concerned about him, what he was going to do, where he was going to go. They just, they just knew he was a very dependable young man. And so after three days, they assumed that he would join back up with the caravan with their community, because they used to travel as a community in those days to go up to the house of the Lord, the, the, tab, the temple in Jerusalem, and, but Jesus didn't show up. So they begin to inquire with all their relatives, all their neighbors, all their friends, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? And nobody had seen Jesus. And so they began a search. Now, if you can put yourself in their shoes, it, it, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty serious. It's serious business. They can't find their son. They don't know what happened to them, and I'm sure they were tormented. I'm sure they were fearful. I'm sure they were upset. This was completely against the character of Christ. This was not his normal routine. They thought, surely something must have happened. And after three days, they end up in the temple looking and searching and hunting for their beloved son, and they can't find him. And all of a sudden, they go into the temple, and they hear his voice. And so... Something happened, if you take a look here, in Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Let's look here in verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass, and this is Luke chapter 2, verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him, now listen, 12 years old. Whew. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. 12 years old. I mean, he is surrounded by doctors of the, of the word. I mean, these are guys who, who are the most learned men out of all of Israel. And for three days, he's kept him in thawed. Listen. And when they saw him, they were amazed. Now, that's Joseph and Mary. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. For in other words, we've been filled with great grief. Jesus, what did you do this for? And now the response that Christ declares, I think is, is, is such a, 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 a revelation of the purpose of Christ coming to the earth. You, you know, we know without a shadow of a doubt, Christ was God in the flesh. He is the only God in the flesh. There is no other God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby they must be saved. Well, what about Buddha? What about Hare Krishna? What about Sun Young Moon? What about, what about Muhammad? These were all just men. They weren't God. They died. They're dead. They're gone. But Christ on the third day rose again from the dead. And, he, he, and, and it says in the book of Timothy, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now this, this Christ, this Jesus, was God in the flesh, born in sinful flesh. And so here Jesus is, 12 years old, and Mary says, where have you been, Jesus? You don't know what you've done to your father and I. And listen to what Jesus said. He only said one thing. And Jesus said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Question mark. Now, now, you know, not one time 
in all the life of Christ in his earthly ministry, did he ever speak a word of deception? For in words, when he asked a question, he was sincere. He was for real. He wasn't artificial. He wasn't synthetic. He wasn't fake. He wasn't a politician, quote unquote. He, he wasn't somebody with an alternative motive. He was sincere. He says to his mother, and he says to Joseph, which is not his father, though he did not correct her. See, that's amazing. In all of those 30 years, as far as we know, he never corrected anybody. Why? Because the father didn't tell him to. And I hear a lot of things a lot of times from people, and my, my mind goes right to the Word of God, and I hear them speaking doctrines that are contrary to the book. And you know what? In my younger years, I would jump on people. I would correct them. I would straighten them up. I would try to get their theology in line with the Scriptures. But as I've gotten hopefully more mature, hopefully more in tune, hopefully more sensitive, God, many times I hear the voice of my Father saying, just let them alone. Just let them alone, yeah. Yeah, it's not my job to speak until my father tells me to. I, I remember as a young boy, my dad, this is the way we were raised in that generation. Don't speak unless you're spoken to. I mean, that's the way I was raised. I mean, we were raised in an old, strict German family, and, and, and my parents would tell me, silence is golden, and children ought to be seen and not heard. Well, well the reason why that is, and, and, and that sounds harsh in our generation, because really a child is not in a position to really be teaching. He needs to be taught. And, and we got a generation that doesn't recognize that. People need to be taught. You're going to learn a lot more by listening than opening up your mouth and putting your foot in it. And I know I've done it. I've eaten, I've eaten my leg up to my kneecap. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> There's things I said after I said it. I wish to God I'd never said that. I said, oh, man, I just really realized. I just, you know, sometimes I didn't even realize how stupid I was until years later. <laughs> and I look back and I go, oh, God, I can't believe I was that stupid. But you understand Christ was the wisdom of God manifested in the flesh. But even though he was the abs, listen, he's got these doctors of the law absolutely astounded. And yet, up to this moment, he had never said a word to a great extent that's recorded. I'm sorry, he spoke to Joseph and Mary and his brothers and his sisters, but we don't have anything recorded. And he says, do you not know? Don't you understand? I'm he, and this is what he says, how is it that you saw me? Why? Why did you seek me? Don't, you, you don't really understand. You don't really understand what this is about, do you? Even though Mary was told by the angel that you will give birth and he will be the Messiah, the Christ, Emmanuel, she still didn't really understand what it was all about. I'm telling you right now, there's many people in the house of God to this day really, I'm talking about born again people. I'm talking about people who have believed in Christ. They really do not understand what it's all about. And so Jesus makes a profound, amazing, serious statement. He said, wist ye not, don't you understand, that I must be about my father's business. Those words are so profound. It literally takes away my breath. You can hear the very heart, the very purpose, the very mission, the very goal, the very, the, 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 the very song that Christ sang. It was, he must be, he said, now he's not talking about his natural father, Joseph. No, he's talking about his heavenly father. I must be about my father's business. I mean, as a 12-year-old young man, this was so deep inside of him. This was a fire that burned, and if we had time, we could go into the old covenant. He says, the zeal of thine house has ate me up. What, what, what do you mean, the zeal of thine house? Have you ever been so zealous, so zealous, that it, it's like a fire that consumes you? This was Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? All, it took faith for him to hold back for for another 18 years, 
I mean, can you imagine? He couldn't wait for the day that he could stand and proclaim the Father's will, that he could reveal his Father to the human race because he was surrounded by the lies of the devil and, and he constantly heard people accusing his Father of things that his Father was not guilty of. I, I remember as a young boy, it was so stupid because I'd get together with the neighbors and we'd be, we'd be literally verbally and even physically fighting each other, bragging about each other's dad. My dad can be your dad. No, he can't. <laughs> Such stupidity. And yet Jesus, here he is. He knows his father is the father of lights in whom there's no verb and there's not a shadow of turning. He knows he's the giver of every good gift. He knows he's the author, the creator of all existing things. And he's hearing people talk about his father with such ignorance and such stupidity. And, and, and yet he, here is as a 12-year-old young man and he zips the lip. Holds it in because it's not yet time. See, there's a time to speak and a time not to speak. And so Jesus, he said, but he reveals to us. He uses the word must. Now, I cannot emphasize if you study that in the Greek. And matter of fact, if you'll look throughout the gospel of Luke, over and over, Jesus used this word in significant places. Now, the word must means absolute, got to, have no choice. What do you mean Jesus didn't have no choice? Let me tell you something. When, when, when there's something that's burning in your heart, you have got to do it. And this is what Jesus, I said, I, I've come to do thy will, O God. It is written of me in a volume of books. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews in the Old Covenant. It is written of me. I'm here to do your will. This is serious business. Let me tell you something. It's serious business. It's serious business. You know, your soul and its eternity is very serious business. The Bible says one soul is worth more than all the wealth of this world. Preaching the gospel is serious, serious business. And that's why even James, the brother of Christ, said, it says, we, he said, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive their greater condemnation. You know, when I received my commission to preach, when I received the call of God upon my heart, I know when I was called to preach, not from my mother's womb, but the day I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I knew that I knew that I knew I was called to preach. I didn't know what preaching was. I was a Catholic. I knew who the Pope was, the bishops were, the nun was, the priest was, the altar boys. I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant to preach, but I knew I had to tell people about this Jesus. I knew I had to stand up and proclaim. I knew. See, at one time when, when, when Jeremiah was fed up, he was fed up with persecution. He was fed up with misunderstandings. Every time he opened his mouth, they would punch him, kick him, knock him down, throw him in a mud pit. I mean, go back and look at Jeremiah. And so Jeremiah, he was finally released by one of the wicked kings of Israel. And he went home and he said, you know what? I'm done, I'm fed up, I'm shutting my mouth. <laughs> but he says it was like a fire shot up in his bones. He said he had to preach the gospel. Paul said, he said, necessity is laid upon me. He said, I must preach the gospel. You know why we're on satellite? Because I've got to do it. I've got to reach out to the masses. I've got to reach out to the multitudes. Now there's a lot of people, you know, they can take it or leave it. And that's how they live their life. They live their life in a laid back, take it easy, cruise control style, you know? But you know what? Those guys out on, that, that are racing in NASCAR, man, I mean, they got the pedal to the metal. They've got to. They've got to win in their mind, in their mind. They've got to win. They've got to win. They've got to win. Listen, that's how we need to be when it comes to the Father's will. I must be about my Father's business. You know, I'm guilty of not being serious enough. The, the, the value of one soul. How, how serious are you? This is serious business. That's the name of this message. This is serious business. The salvation of your family, the salvation of your children, the salvation of your loved ones, the salvation of your neighbors, the salvation of your community. I mean, this is serious business because once they breathe their last breath, it's too late. And so Jesus at 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business. Now I can prove to you the reason why we can see it's not very serious is because I can only take you where I'm at. If, if this is not serious to me, sometimes when something's serious, listen to me, 
Sometimes when something is serious and it's, and it's scriptural, it's biblical, it's real, it's authentic, it's serious in your heart, you can get in the flesh. I know many times that my passion and my zeal to get the gospel out, my passion and my zeal to see people get right with God has overwhelmed me and I've gotten in the flesh. But now Jesus, though he was consumed with his Father's will, yet he himself did not ever get in the flesh. But at 12 years old, you know, if we just stayed right here on this scripture, it'd be powerful. At 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business. Now, I'd like to encourage you to do a little study of the New Testament, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look up the word must. Every time Jesus used the word must, as a matter of fact, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give you a couple of scriptures. And, and Jesus said this in Mark 11, 13, 10. He said, and the gospel must first be published to all nations. Notice the word must. It's got to be. This is serious business. We have got to preach the gospel. You know, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we must, we must, get this in your heart, we must preach the gospel. We must seek after God. We must hunger after righteousness. Jesus said, you must. He said to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who was sincere, he, he, he said, you must be born again. There, there is, it's, it's no, you know, it's not like you're buying a car and you got options. You know, well, I want this and I want that. I want white wall tires and I want air conditioning and I want, I want a vibrating seat. No, man. No, man. We must, we must be about the Father's business. And I, I believe that God is stirring people up. God is trying to fire people up. I, I, I believe the reason why in Luke, in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, when he talks about the lukewarm church, you know who the lukewarm church is? Those who don't see the must. They don't see it as serious business. Oh, well, it's not serious. I, I don't really need to pray. I don't need to fast. I don't, me I did, I don't need to memorize scriptures. I, I don't really need to share my faith. I, I, don't really, I don't really need to go to church. You, you watch this. This is the atmosphere that's in the world today and that is in the church today. I don't really need to. Well, Christ had the opposite of approach. He said, I've got to. I've just got to, I've, I've got to, I've got to. See, and this is one thing that, that God put in my heart uh, back in 1975. I've got to serve him. I've got to love him. I've got to seek him. I've got to go all the way. I've got to give him everything. I've got to die to myself. I mean, for 38 years, this thing's burned in my heart. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. I must, this is serious business and, and time is running out and it's like an invisible hourglass I see within my mind and the, the grains of my life, the seconds, the minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks, the months, the years, the decades are dribbling down through the neck of that hourglass and I see I'm running out of time. Jesus said the night cometh when no man can work. Oh, Father, deliver us from this pacifism. Deliver us from this lukewarmness. Deliver this from I can take it or leave it attitude. Deliver us from this thought that, that I, I have tomorrow. Well, what if you don't have tomorrow? You know, it says in Ephesians, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. I am sending forth the sound of a trumpet, a warning, brothers and sisters in Christ. We must be up and at it. We must be about our Father's business. We must get serious. We must take a hold of the will of God. We must crucify the flesh. This is serious business it doesn't matter how I feel it doesn't matter how it looks it doesn't matter what men say about me it doesn't matter what takes place in the economy in the government even physically it doesn't matter what happens to me all that matters is I must be about my father's business Oh, I would hope and pray by the Holy Ghost that the Spirit of the living God, the very Spirit that of Christ, see, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit that was in Christ, it's Christ Jesus, is in us. And He wants to motivate us. He wants to stir us. He wants to compel us. He wants to, he wants to urge us. He wants to quicken us. He, he wants us to stand up and get serious. Get serious. You know, every, every man in the pulpit ought to be serious. 
I, I'm sorry to say there's times I've been in the pulpit and I wasn't serious. I, I need to be serious when it comes to my walk with God. I, I need to be, you know, we have a society today, they're not serious about raising their children. They're not serious about their marriage. They're not serious about their job. I'm, 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 you know, it's, it's a terrible joke, but you go down the highway and you see people who work for the state and you got one man digging and you got six guys leaning on their shovel. It used to be three. Now it's six, seven, eight guys standing there and they're not serious. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, it's not like making the sparks fly. They don't got their nose to the grindstone. It's this lay back, take it easy, everything's okay attitude. But I think that's what the attitude was on, on, on the Titanic before it hit the iceberg. Everybody's having a party until they hit the iceberg, and they still didn't know what was going on. I'm telling you what, America has hit the iceberg. I'm telling you, they said the Titanic, even God himself could not sink it. I'm telling you, America is sinking and the preachers are at fault because we're not serious about what we believe. Are you serious? I'm serious when it comes to divine healing. By his stripes ye were healed. Well, if I were, then I was. If I was, I am. And if I am, then I is. I, 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 I is healed. I, I am healed. I'm serious. I'm serious now, Dan. I ain't got no volume. I am serious. I am serious. You, you got to get serious. You, you got to get serious. You, listen to me. You've got to get serious. I, I can't make you serious. I can't wake you up. I, I, I just pray the Holy Ghost will stir you up. I just pray the fire of heaven would fall upon you. And, and, and this 12-year-old young man, and, and it took him all the way. It took him all the way into the River Jordan where he was baptized in water by John and the Holy Ghost came on him and it led him into the wilderness and he was tempted and tested and tried for 40 days. And he, he, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. I, I see it, it's like, it's like somebody, I lived in Alaska for a while and there's what they called the gold rush in Alaska and, and, and people took it seriously. It's amazing what people will do for money. I, it's incredible. People will get themselves killed for money. And yet they won't, they won't crucify their flesh for Christ. They won't die for Christ. I mean, I have literally seen people, and I say this in love now, I'm just saying this in love. I have seen people that are so serious for games, for hobbies, for Mickey Mouse stupid stuff, but they're not serious for God. Now, what kind of insanity is that? How come we're not serious for God? How come we're not up and at it for God? How come we're not bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for God? How, how come we're not obsessed with God? You know, Christ, God the Father was obsessed. Listen to me. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost are obsessed with our deliverance, with our freedom, with our salvation. With, 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 with us spending eternity with him. Look at the price he paid. He became a physical man. He took upon himself the likeness of man. He was made a servant. He humbled himself and he suffered the shame, the agony of the cross. So if you just took the Gospel of Luke and you read what Jesus said, he used the word must, he used it spurringly, but every time he did it, it was like a vein of gold discovered in the mountainside. You know, it's like the old miners, they would dig a hole into the side of a mountain, into the, and, and I cannot imagine their hands being busted and bruised and, and the cold of the night and, and the heat of the day and, they, and, and, and the perils they were in, the, the wolves, the wolverines and the grizzlies and, 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 and how many people died trying to find a, a gold, a vein of gold. You know, it's a vein, and, and so they dug until they saw that yellow, and then when they saw the yellow, it took over them, and they would just dig and dig hundreds and, 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 and hundreds of feet into a mound with just sheer willpower. Where is that in the church? The vein of gold is the will of the Father. 
It's the purpose of the Father. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Are we driven? Are we, are we, are we motivated? Are we stirred? Are we, are we on fire for God, for souls, so, for, to, to touch people's lives? Are, are we just playing stupid games? Are we just playing stupid games? Just wasting our time, spinning our tires in stupid stuff that isn't going to save a soul. God wants us to be serious people. God wants us to be passionate. God wants us to pay the price. God wants us to go all the way. Why? It's not just our salvation. It's, it's, it's the souls of your children. It's the souls of your grandchildren. It's the souls of your mom and dad. It's the souls of your co-workers, of your neighbors, of your brothers and sisters in Christ. God, stir us up and make me serious. Jesus, at 12 years old, at 12 years old, said, I must be. This is serious business. I must be about my father's business. Oh, God, the early church was so serious, so serious. They were willing to die. They were willing to suffer. They were willing to experience anything for the will of the father to be accomplished. And Jesus said unto his disciples in Luke 4, 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I sent, I must, I must. Pastor Mike, why? Why? Pastor Mike, don't you understand the pressure it puts on you to have to believe God for $30,000 a month to propagate the gospel? Pastor Mike, why don't you just sit back? Why don't you just take it easy? Why don't you just eat, drink, and be merry? No, I can't. I can't. Even people are loved sometimes. They say to me, why do you got to do this? I, I can't explain it to them. If you don't know, I can't tell you. It's not something you think. It's something you feel. It's a fire that, that burns deep in your soul. It's a fire that overwhelms you. It's a fire that consumes you. It's a fire. It's the fire of heaven. It's the fire of God. Deep in your heart, you just ain't got no choice. I must preach the gospel. I can't relate with people who say, well, I don't know if I want to do this. You're, you're, you're not going to be a winner. You know, even in the natural Olympics, you've got to run the race as if only one person is going to win. Paul said, I strive towards the mark. I, I strive towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. People are selling their inheritance for a stinking bowl of porridge. And the day will come when they're going to stand before God and they will weep and wail and cry because they blew it. They blew their chance. They blew their opportunity. They blew it. They just blew it royally. They just threw it away, their inheritance, their calling, their, that God has called them and chose them and anointed them and empowered them and equipped them to win souls, to set the captives free and they... They blew it on some stupid Mickey Mouse, insane, ridiculous, stupid thing. When they ought to rise up like mighty men of war, they ought to rise up with fire and fervor and hunger for God. They ought to rise up in the name of Jesus and say, enough's enough. Enough's enough. I'm done playing games. I'm, I'm going all the way. Whew. I'm going all the way. See, you understand, I... I really don't know anybody that kicked me in the butt. I don't know anybody that really kicked me in the butt. And Come on, Pastor Mike, get with it. Come on, do it. Come on, get serious. Come on, go all the way for God, Pastor Mike. And, and to be honest, most people would pull me into their lukewarmness and their lackadaisical and their everything's all right attitude. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you should go from hearing a message like this and attack anybody. No, attack yourself. Pull the beam out of your own eye. Get serious with God. Recognize souls are at jeopardy. They're perishing all the way around us. And we've got to have a move. We've got to have a move. We've got to have a move of the Holy Ghost. We've got to. 
We got to. And yes, it's going to cost you everything. And Jesus said, I must preach the gospel. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. That's what he said in Luke 9. He says, and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. He must, the Son of Man must suffer. Listen, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must, listen, you, you gotta, you gotta suffer. You gotta, you gotta deny yourself. You gotta take up your cross. You must, you must hate your life. Because if you don't hate your life, you'll never experience the next life. You must die. We must be crucified with Christ. We must. See, you, you can't let this thing be an option. You can't let it be a suggestion. You can't let it be if I want to or if I don't. You, you know, I, I'm, God is looking. God is looking for people that are fired up for him. And, 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 and you know, my, my son and I were down in Suriname, and God dropped a message into my heart, and we began to propagate it. And I, I saw fire begin to flow uh, through, 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 through the Surimanese, and, and we began to preach 100%, 100%, 100% for Christ. And, 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 and the natives of that country began to shout it with us. But when we got there, they were just so lackadaisical, lay back, everything's okay. It's like hypnotism. I'm telling you, it is demonic. This hypnotism, this sleep that has come upon the body, the bride, the church, no passion in the pulpit, no hunger for God, no desperation for a move this way. I know I'm not supposed to shout. I just can't help it sometimes. That passion rises up in me, and it breaks my heart. See, I, I, I've got to fight. I've got to fight that pacifism in me 24-7. I've got to fight that. It's going to be okay in me 24-7. I, I tell you what, Pastor Mike, you act like you're fighting for your life. I am. I'm, I'm not just fighting for my life. I'm fighting for my wife and my children and my, my, my sons and my, and my daughter and my daughter-in-law and, and, and the congregation and everybody I run into. And, 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 and it's like, awake thou to sleepers and arise from the dead. It's like a watchman on the wall declaring that the enemy is upon us. The enemy is upon us. The enemy is upon us. And, and he's in us. And we got to rise up. We got to rise up. Mighty men and women of God, it's time to stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's time to stop playing games. It's time. It's time. It's time. 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 Time is the most valuable thing we've got. And time is running out. Time is running out. How many, how many people have I put under the ground? How many people have I buried in the last almost 40 years of ministry, and I go visit them in the hospital, and as they're laying there of a terminal disease, they're watching a soap opera. Of all things, they're watching a movie. They're watching, I mean, I've gone into the waiting rooms, and their mother and their father is in the hospital room, and they're dying, and instead of crying out to God, they're playing some kind of stupid little handheld video game. Their mom is dying. Their dad is dying. Their brother is dying. Their sister is dying. And instead of crying and weeping and taking a hold of God and, and, and crying out to the Lord, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're hypnotized. They're hypnotized by demonic powers. Jesus at 12 years old. How do we wake people up, Father? How do we wake people up, God? I don't know how to wake people up, man. I take the bell and I ring it and ring it. I blow the trumpet. I preach the gospel. I, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. People will come and hear a message like this. And they'll watch a message like this. And they'll hear the truth like this. And they'll go right back out right back out and they're walking on rotten canvas over hell they're walking on thin ice and they're about to break through and they don't even know it and it's like you can't get them to get serious god's got to do this father you've got to do this father you have got to wake us up father you have got to wake up this generation this generation that is so lost and preaching a message that does not cause people to 
to run for the altar. They used to run for the altar. People used to run. The preachers would preach with such conviction and such fire and such passion and such uh, 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 enthusiasm and such, such moving of the spirit that it would move people to the altar. They would run for the altar and cry out and say, God, God, have mercy on my soul. God, please forgive us, but, but it's like, they're just, you look in their faces. I'm talking about people who come to the so-called house of God. You look in their faces and you can see their eyes are spiritually dead. There's no, there's no fire in their eyes. There's no compassion in their heart. There's no up and gumption inside of them. It's just like they're dead. They're just dead men walking, just dead bearing the dead, just dead, dead to revelation, dead to Jesus Christ, dead to the price he paid, dead to the sufferings of God, dead, dead to the reality of a hell beneath us, filled with millions and billions of lost souls that is expanding every minute, every hour. Dead. Dead to truth. Oh, Father. Father, resurrect. Father, bring truth. Father, Jesus, I know you're knocking at the door of people right now watching. I know you're knocking on their doors. I, I know you're pleading with them with such pleadings and such, such, such movings of the Spirit that surely it should get through to them. And you're at the door, and like in the book of, 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 of the, 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 the Songs of Solomon where you're beseeching your beloved and you're sticking your hand even through the, the door opening and, and, and you're wanting to open the door, but your beloved is ignoring you until finally when she opens the door, you're gone. How many people are going to wait to open the door too late? It says there will be a day when they will strive to enter in, but they will not be able to enter in. He says strive, 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 strive to enter in at the straight gate, for straight is the way and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be which find it. How come they're not finding it when God says they can find it? Because they really don't care you, you worship me with your lips but your heart is far from me you say you love me but you won't pray you won't read your bible you won't share christ with others you won't give financially you you say you love me but who are you lying to you're lying to yourself jesus at 12 years old what a Serious business, serious business. His mind was consumed with a holy fire that said, I must. Oh, God, give us, give us that heart. Give us that heart of Jesus. Give us that character of Jesus. Give us that attitude of Jesus. Give us that mind of Jesus. Give us that desire of Jesus, that longing of Jesus, that I long to do thy will, O oh God. I desire to do thy will, O oh God. Are we just beating our heads against the concrete wall? Is this generation lost? Is it so hard? Is it so cold? Is it so dead to, to, the, to, to, the, to, to the wailings and the weepings of the damned to where we can't hear them? I hear them. I hear them. I hear the weeping and the wailing of the damned. And all they want is a drop of water on their parched lips and there's no water to be had. We say we... We love Christ. We say we know Christ. We say we care about people going to hell, but how much do we really? How much do I? See, I need to be consumed. I, I need God to consume me. He says, Jesus said in Luke 17, he said, but first must I suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Jesus said, I've got to suffer. He said, if I'm suffering, you're going to suffer. Hallelujah. That's the rejoicing is in the sufferings of Christ. You will be rejected. You will be hated. You will be despised of all men. But great will be your reward in heaven. Great, great, great reward. Um, when we get to heaven, we're never going to regret the fact that we gave too much to God. Never. When I get to heaven, I know without a shadow of a doubt, I'll not be saying, oh man, I didn't have to pray as much. I didn't have, Pastor Mike, you're preaching works. No, I'm preaching faith. 
faith, hope, and love. I, I'm, preach, I'm preaching, he that is forgiven of much loveth much. That's the problem. People don't know how much they've been forgiven because they're carnal, comparing themselves to one another. Well, I could understand Mary Magdalene, Pastor Mike, because, you know, she had seven demons, and they think she was a prostitute. No, you don't understand. There's none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness is filthy rags. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We all deserve hell. We all deserve the wrath of God. We all deserve the anger of the Lord. But yet he extended his mighty right arm and he became a man for you. you got to make this personal or it will never be serious. He died for you. He died for your sins, your transgressions, your evil heart, wicked heart, perverted heart. He died for you. Why? That he could make you like him. <laughs> that he could take you into heaven forever. And so over and over, Jesus said, I must, I must, I must. He said to Z Z Zacchaeus the day that he was up in the sycamore tree, he says, make haste. Come on down quickly, Zacchaeus. Why? Because I'm on a timetable. I'm on a schedule. See, people don't realize that sometimes you run into busy businessmen and they don't got time to sit around and chat and waste time because they got to be here and they got to be here and they got to be here and, and that's all foolishness. But Jesus had a time schedule. He knew. He knew in his heart he had three and a half years to accomplish the impossible. He had three and a half years to touch lives. He had three and a half years to make a difference. Do you understand your time to make a difference is running out? Your time to do something for God is running out. Some of you are watching, you're, you're close to death and don't even know it. Here, about three years ago, I was preaching in the congregation on a Sunday morning, and I looked out, and I looked at an older gentleman who, 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 who was, 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 had been a Sunday school teacher, and he had, he had shared Christ, but he had gone into a stage of, of lackadaisicalness, and over the pulpit, I said, listen, I said, you've got three months, and I didn't name him by name, I just looked at him, and I knew, you've got three months to get up off of that couch of ease, to get up off of that couch of laziness, and go to work for God, or you're going to be taken out of this world. I said it by the Spirit. After the service, this man usually does never approach me. We talk a little bit. Good brother. He came up to me, got talking, and I told him, I said, brother, I said, you got three months. I said, you better get with it. I said, your time is running out. Well, I'm sorry to say, three months later, he died from a heart attack. He never did get up off his couch of ease. He never did. I'm not saying he wouldn't share Jesus with anybody. I'm not saying he didn't make it to heaven. But whew, what can we say? What, what's going to wake you up? Over and over, Jesus said, you know, Paul had it. Paul said, I press. He said, I press. I press toward the mark for the prize. What prize? The high calling. The high calling. The high calling. What a calling. What a privilege to be workers in the harvest field. What a privilege to be sufferers with Christ. What a privilege to be co-workers with Jesus. What a privilege to have our feet sod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Blessed are the feet of the, that preach the good news. What we're so privileged, I am so, so privileged to, to be allowed to preach the gospel. I, I'm not ordained by men. I, I'm ordained by God to produce much fruit. What, and people are treating their calling, they're, they're treating their, 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 their calling like as if it's, it, it's, it's, it's nothing. It has no value. It has no significance. Holy Spirit, those who are watching today, Holy Spirit, those who will be watching this video, why won't you men and women that are called of God to preach lay down your Mickey Mouse stupid stuff 
There's some of you that are working jobs, and God told you a long time ago he was your source, and you won't quit your jobs. You won't forsake everything. You won't let go. Why won't you? Don't you see that your reward in heaven will be great? Let go. Let go. And I'm not talking about quitting your job and laying around at home. I'm saying go for God. Just go for God. Just what does this stuff matter anyways? It says we came into this world with nothing. We're going to leave with nothing. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Come on, man. It's time to work. Elijah said to Gehazi when he got the wealth from Naaman the leper, he says, is it a time for vineyards? Is it a time for men slaves and women slaves? Is it a time for houses and land and clothing? I'm telling you no. Brothers and sisters, by the Spirit of God, I'm calling you out of the world into the harvest field. By the Spirit of God, I'm calling you out of the foolishness. I'm calling you out of the Mickey Mouse stuff. I'm calling you out, calling you out. It's time to get serious for God. It's time to go preach the gospel. It's time. It's time. And if now ain't the time, when will be the time? Another year, you might not have another year. Another, another month, another month, just another month, another month. I remember years ago, and I'll share this before I close, I, I was... I'm talking about back in 1979, I was pastoring an Assembly God church. And I, I was on fire for God, but there was a, a, a woman whose name was Mom Gearhart. She owned Mom's Pizza Shop. I think it's still there in Huntington, Pennsylvania. And I would go up there, and she had a Pac-Man machine. Back in them days, that was... And I would go in and put a couple quarters in there and not pay, play Pac-Man and... <clears throat> Uh, but every time I'd go, and one day I went up there, and Mom Gearhart, she came out from behind the counter, and, 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 and she handed me a big bag of coins. She said, here you go, Mike. Wow, whoa, thank you, Jesus. No, it wasn't thank you, Jesus. And I began to drop, and I'm telling you, my wife sat there and watched me. I'm in there. I must have played that stupid Pac-Man game. I bet I played it for over six hours. Here I am, and one, finally, after about six hours, the Spirit of God rose up in me, and I heard like the audible voice of God with such, he was so upset with me. He said, son, what are you doing? I was shocked. I said, what, Lord? He said, what are you doing? He said, there's been souls walking by you, people coming into this pizza shop, you got your eyes on that stupid video game. I tell you, it shook me so deep. I walked out of that pizza shop. I walked away from that game. And out of almost 34 years, I think, I've only played Pac-Man very briefly once or twice ever again because it shook me so deep that my father was upset with me because I was wasting my life on a stupid game while souls were going to hell. You ain't going to make me feel bad. You ain't going to make me feel bad, bad, Pastor Mike. Well, I'm sorry I can't. I'm sorry I'm trying to make you by the Holy Ghost. I want you to feel so ashamed. God, forgive me for playing stupid games. Father, forgive me for being caught up in sports. I've done stupid things since then. We got a book coming out because I need God because I'm stupid. I've wasted my life on stupid, vain things. But then the fire of God begins to rise up in me again. And I say, okay, God, I'm at it again. I'm seeking your heart again. I'm pressing it again. I'm hungry for you again. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me, God, for all those hours I wasted. Father, forgive me. Help me once again put my hands to the plow, and not look back. Amen. You can stop recording.